So in our next discussion, we'll talk a bit more about this, how technology is impacting those traditional setups and industries. And to lead that panel, the moderator for this is Cecil Nutako. So if we're ready to go, let's chat. Hi, Cecil. Hello. My name is Cecil. Uh, I'm a technology enthusiast. But I hate it when technology makes my life miserable. Today we're going to find out how miserable and even more miserable technology is going to make our lives. And we have to learn how to adapt so we don't get too disappointed. So we're talking about disruption. Disruption. How our traditional industries might go away or might get better or might just live forever with technology to help me do that we have four distinguished people who have spent some time in this space in different industries so they're going to share their experiences with us and then we're going to try to see how we can chat a way forward to join me we have jacqueline omosombo Omotalade, I got that right. Yeah! <laughs> She's from Uber, West Africa. And then we have David Hashful from Bloom Impact. And then we have Dennis Addo from Bisa. And then we have Walali Senyo from Farmerline. So you see where this is going. We've got agriculture, we've got healthcare, we've got finance, right? And then we've got hmm, Uber. <laughs> anyway, so panelists, you're welcome. I hope this is going to be fun. Let's not scare them too much. Right? Give them some hope. All right, so audience, your panelists, panelists, your audience. Let's go quickly into it. I want each of you to introduce yourselves briefly. And then tell us one particular disruption that you experienced in your career or as growing up. And how did that impact you to be who you are today? Okay. Ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I am so happy to be here um, representing a company that I am truly, truly passionate about um, and all the work that we do. My name is Jacqueline Omotalade, and I am head of public policy for Uber West Africa. Now, the question I'm supposed to answer is disruption in my life. And I would say I moved back to West Africa. I'm, I'm currently based in, in Lagos, although West Africa is my whole region. I moved back to West Africa earlier this year after spending eight years in San Francisco. So I would say the disruptive technology that I first experienced is the company that I work for now is when, when Uber, Uber launched in, in San Francisco. And I remember you know, standing on a corner of uh, Market Street in San Francisco and seeing people look down at their phone and asking like, what are they, what are they doing? Like, and people were like, they're waiting for their car. And I'm like, why are they looking at their phone as they're waiting for a car to come pick them up? And they're like, yeah, because things are changing. Um, and so I say just coming from spending eight years in San Francisco and seeing where technology is truly embraced and thinking outside the box and really like disrupting and changing things and you know going to coffee shops and just seeing people on their computers like thinking about how to not only change San Francisco or the United States of America but like the world um, and then coming back to, to Lagos um, my hometown and really that same energy i mean the hustle spirit is still is very much present and relevant in, in west africa and i'm so happy to kind of be a part of of the disrupting things on this continent as well interesting we'll find out how uber is going to be disrupted itself <laughs> david yeah tell us some uh hi uh good morning uh, so my name is uh, David Hatchful. Um, my background has always been in technology. I was trained as a software developer and a, a user experience designer. Um, and uh, currently uh, also an entrepreneur, uh, currently on my third business, uh, which is Bloom Impact, and we're disrupting the financial services space, uh, particularly for small, uh, medium, and small, medium enterprise uh, uh, businesses. Um, and you know, I'll tell you more about that later. Um, in terms of, of what disruption 
I'm, I'm going to cheat and give two. So one, being in computers, uh, the idea of just having a, a computer or a, a mobile computer has, has disrupted my, I mean, it's basically changed my whole life and that's what my life is following now. What Bill Gates kind of dreamt about putting a PC on everybody's uh, uh, desktop, uh, desk uh, has been, for me, uh, pretty revolutionary. But more recently, I'll say two things. One, uh, Express Pay, which is a payment platform that's in Ghana. Um, and because it's, it's unbelievable that every time I pay somebody or move money around uh, using that platform, I just think about that crowd traffic that I don't have to sit in <laughs> to get that done. Uh, and it makes me smile. Um, and then secondly is uh, MTS, uh, I think it's uh, star 506 hash. So when you run out of credit, you can just put that in and they give you an extra credit line so you can actually get back online and top up. Um, I, that, that saved my life so many times. <laughs> Something that simple, I think it's, it's, it's great. Uh, that's very practical. <laughs> Dennis? Yes, uh, good morning everyone. Yes, so uh, I'm Dennis Addo. I'm a, I'm a physician, uh, entrepreneur, and an innovator, I would say. Uh, I run a, a company called Claron Health International and also a co-founder of a startup, BISA. I'm sure most of you heard about BISA yesterday and what we do and uh, other few projects that I do. Now, I would say I'm sure most of you have been to hospitals in Ghana, right? Uh, where typically you sit in front of the doctor and he keeps writing and uh, sometimes you can't even see the prescription part, what is written and there have been a few instances where uh, prescription errors have occurred because people can't see handwritings and all. So I think one major disruption I've, I've seen in my life uh, in Ghana in particular is about uh, the concept of the health information management system or digitization of healthcare. Uh, everything is moving paperless now. If you come to our, our clinic, it's, it's completely paperless, right from the doctor's office to, to your consulting rooms, to the pharmacy. It's all paperless and it's, it's all enabled because of technology. And also even with BSI and the work we are doing, uh, people are able to interact with doctors right in the comfort of their homes all for free and also uh, ask any questions, take pictures of a skin condition and send it through, and the doctors, wherever they are in the country, are able to respond and get you the information that they need in real time. So I think uh, there's been a huge disruption, and, and I'm sure you're going to talk more about it, and I'll share more as we go along, All right? Thank you. Thank you. Senor. Yes. Tell me about your drones. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my name is Walali Senor, and I work with Farmerline. Um, so my background is in agriculture, so I'm a trained farmer. Mm -hmm. um, I did my master's in ICT and that's where the, the blend also comes in. And uh, I work with a very innovative company that is, you know, looking to disrupt the agricultural landscape. And uh, I'm sure in our discussions we'll get the opportunity to share more. Um, one disruption that I've experienced in my lifetime, I would say, is the mobile phone, getting access to the mobile phone. I, I, I don't know how many of you, you know, remember back in the 2000, at least, I mean, when it became very affordable for some of us to jump onto the bandwagon. Uh, we had to queue, I was in Legon Hall, uh, I had to queue, you know, just to get access to, I think it was then 250 cities uh, to get access to the, uh, the sim. And now it's almost literally free. And that tool is really changing the world, changing how farmers are interacting with markets, with information. And I believe for me, that's been the epitome of everything. Um, information is now being accessed on our mobiles. Um, and now even computing power is almost a par compared to what you have on your desktop, on your mobile, on your mobile phone. And that's the beauty of that device. So for me, that's one of the disruptions I would say I've experienced. Interesting. Yeah. Looks like everybody's got a very unique one. Uh, you're wondering what's mine, right? <laughs> For me, it was open source technologies. Yeah. <sighs> that was so cool, you know? When you realize I don't need to pay so much money for proprietary software anymore, and I could just go get my Python or my Apache or set up my QMail, mm -hmm. and people were paying me for that. Like, that was cool. That changed everything for me. Because then we all knew you could build your own mail servers, your own DNS servers, your own proxy servers, but 
that's a lot of money to even get the platform. Then all of a sudden, Langnos, all of a sudden, open source, all of a sudden, and that actually sparked a lot of people entering into the programming world, and today everybody's building an app. For me, that was it for me. All right, so I know everybody has their own. Uh, during the networking session, I would love to hear some interesting ones. All right, now going forward, I think healthcare is very critical to everybody. Uh, if I had woken up today a bit sick, I think this panel would have been hot, right? Of course, yeah. <laughs> so let's let's go drive straight into healthcare. You you mentioned uh, the transformation that's happening within the health sector. And that sounds interesting. So we're digitizing our processes. But how does that make me not to fall sick? The idea here is prevent, preventive healthcare. There are technologies like CRISPR, right? So CRISPR is spelled C-R-I-S-P-R. C-R-I-S-P-R. Check it out. It's a DNA editing technology that can allow you to edit my DNA at the embryo level so that chronic diseases like Corella or typhoid or even disabilities that I might have would not happen. So like practically, I'll never fall sick again. When are we going to try something like that? Are we ready? Is Ghana as a society, as a people, are we ready? For that technology because it is happening i saw it with my own eyes when so uh, uh i would say even before we get to the complex technologies of dna and uh, artificial intelligence and all i think there are some brilliant simple innovations that are going on uh, a couple of months ago in ghana i'm sure most of you heard the news of a uh, a 21-year-old girl who lost her life because uh, she could not get blood. I mean, the dad was roaming around town trying to find blood for this young girl who, uh, by the time the father found the blood, she eventually passed away, which was a, a very sad story. And very sad. But if you, if you move across the border and you go to Rwanda, there's a, there's a technology that are pioneering. Called, uh, there's a company called Zipline. And what they are doing is that they are using drones to drop blood to remote villages. I mean, it's going to take about three, four hours for the blood to get there. So, but with, the, with this technology, just people just send a simple text message, WhatsApp, and they activate their warehouses. And then within a few minutes, the drones drop this blood to, 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 the, to the areas where it's needed. So look at how... This can impact even if we have such a technology in Ghana and the, the, the impact it can make. Another simple one that is also making wave, I mean, BISA, we won the International Young Innovators Awards. We are in uh, Bangkok to receive the award. And one of the technology that have been pioneered by guys in South Korea is just a simple device attached to the babies. You know, in Ghana, infant mortality is quite high. It's about uh, 37 per 100,000. That means, no, 37 per thousand live births, sorry. So that means that the probability that you're going to die as a baby within your first year of life is, is within about 37 per every thousand live births, which is extremely high. If you, if you rate among about 200 countries, Ghana is about 164 out of about uh, 240 countries or so, and it's, it's quite high. So what these guys have done is a simple device that you put on the, the diaper of the baby, and if the temperature goes up, it's, it's recorded on your phone. You can add as many people as you want, including the physicians. And this helps them to more or less uh, be able to take action immediately. If the baby is turned in a way that can cause them to lose oxygen as well, it's, it's, it's something that they respond. So these are simple, practical technologies that can come. Now, coming back to the DNA technology, I think... Uh, we are not there yet. In the, if there's simple problems, you've not even solved it. Malaria is still high, and uh, people die of malaria, uh, cholera, like you said, tuberculosis. And coupled with that, chronic diseases is also going up. About 40% of Ghanaians 
can we have hypertension? About 10 years ago, it used to be less than 5% or so. Diabetes is also high. So these are basic problems that we are still grappling with. And what we need is to get technology to more or less at the basic level, help to I mean, get our data right, get these information right, then we can take action before the DNA technology and others can come in. I'm sure in the next five years or so it will come, but my, for now we need to My get point it. is, yes. you want to take baby steps okay. to solve corella, uh, chronic diseases, because you think you are not there yet. Whilst you can just use CRISPR and just jump that whole baby steps. Why wait 10 years if you can do it in 10 hours? Sure. I, I, I think, the, uh, for example, the issue of cholera is not necessarily a health issue, or at least the origination of it. it yeah. It's a sanitation issue. Exactly. And so there are certain uh, diseases or there are certain health conditions which are more, uh, more have to do with education and educating people to live certain lifestyles, to have certain um, positive health behaviors, which would then lead to prevention, better than, say, altering uh, DNA. I mean, when penicillin was found and, um, you know, it was great, it was killing everything, it was solving all the problems. Now there are big problems with antibiotics and, you know, uh, basically our whole ecosystem becoming uh, resistant to certain antibiotics. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, to, to his point, uh, it's not that we're going to take baby steps to solve these problems, but, um, you know, I, I think as particularly in Ghana and in Africa, we're very excited about leapfrogging and particularly using technology to leapfrog. But a lot of times technology will help you leapfrog, but the people also, both in the state of mind and in understanding and in the heart also need to be moved along. And so you could leapfrog with your technology, but if the people are not there, then um, it's not going to be effective. Um, my old boss, uh, Kentaro, used to, uh, we used to work for a team called Technology for Emerging Markets. Um, and what we found was that technolo technology will always amplify what already exists. If you take technology and put it in a corrupt system and you don't deal with the core issues of corruption, people's ethical uh, outlay, you, the corruption is going to be worse than you expected because technology is an amplifier. It's going to help you do things a lot better. And if you are corrupt, it's going to help you do corruption a lot better. All right. So, so clearly, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> so clearly, it's, it's not that we're not there. We can actually apply these technologies, but we need to come along with the population, the people we want this technology to help. We need to bring them to speed. How did Uber do that? Because, yeah, you know, at least I use it a lot. So how did you bring people up to speed just like that? Well, I mean, if you, if you think about, like, the concept of Uber at its core, right? It's taking, connecting a rider with a driver, right? I mean, that has been around since the beginning of time, like people looking to get from point A to point B. So this, in some ways, isn't necessarily a revolutionary concept. I mean, we at Uber like to think it is, and in some ways it is. I mean, we've brought technology into that, but the whole idea of there are people who need to move from point A to point B, and how do we move them there? and using technology to, once again, amplify that. And that's exactly what, what Uber has done and the whole ride-sharing space has done. And then just to continue to think bigger, now that we can move a person from point A to point B, what else can we move? And how can we use what we've learned from moving people to continue to make that more effective and more efficient and, um, and really just change things? OK, that sounds more like agreeing to where we're going. I'm liking this because I want people to walk out of here knowing the pros and the cons of how disruption will help our traditional industries and how they can improve and how we as a people need to come along. So I think we're getting there. Senor, GMOs. <laughs> GMOs. Yeah. Is it really a bad idea or we're just making some, you know? <laughs> uneducated guesses you, yeah. you, are, you are the agriculture man GMOs. Um, yeah it's an ongoing debate mm -hmm. uh, the worldwide worldwide it's an ongoing debate but uh, like any technology there are you know good side and bad side it can be used for good it can be used for bad or can, there can be consequences but to date there is no proven you know scientific um, side effect of GMO as such that has been reported what you have are, of course, people, you know, views of thoughts, you know, holding different uh, perspectives to what GMO entails. And a lot of 
the issues are uh, people not having clarity of mind in terms of what it is and uh, some business interests also at stake. Uh, but just to put some you know, facts out there, um, in, in the US, for example, 85% of corn that is consumed is GMO. So in Ghana, if you say you don't want GMO, you already have GMO products on the market. Soya bean, almost all of soya bean that is produced in the USA is GMO. And we consume a lot of soya products, right? Imported and mostly from the US. So, you know, taking the argument beyond that, oh, um, GMO is not good for us and whatnot, I think it's not the point. The issue is what are the safeguard measures that are being put in place, like for any technology that is brought into, let's say, the agricultural space to improve producti production and also save um, plants from diseases and pests. Um, the issue we have goes beyond just uh, productivity. Um, we need to also learn how to, you know, manage our uh, consumption. A lot of waste. I mean, uh, 1.3 billion tons of food goes to waste every year, and that can feed 3 million uh, billion people in the world. Okay, but GMOs are very. I mean, I think they have a very big role to play. You made mention of the technology that is going to help take away um, what you call diseases and whatnot. Yeah. Now, the concept of GMO is just basically introducing a gene of you know, a different organism into another organism to you know, elicit some positive effect that you, uh, you want. So for example, we have the BT, which is a very popular one in cotton and also in soya in um, cowpea. Yeah. Basically, what that does is prevent the, um, the cotton from being eaten by insects. And that reduces you know, uh, market value and farmers would improve. And these are all things that go to help. But then oftentimes, people don't get a full understanding of what it is. And they feel, oh, they're going to take a whole organism and you know, input in our food. And we're going to eat. And like, what is the condition Again. we're going to get? And that's oftentimes, people speak out of uh, not knowing the full fact. And, um, so I would say that GMO are here to stay. They're already around, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, across the globe, there are governments having you know regulatory issues, issues yeah. on how it can be rolled out. Okay. Um, on the commercial side, there is also you know something we should note: the technology that is developed using GMO is taken by uh, breeders, and they then go ahead to multiply that as, let's say, hybrid seeds for farmers to use. Um, they can choose to use a particular approach, which is, let's say, hybrid seed, you use it, and that is the end. You have to come back the next season to buy from them. Okay. And there is a, a good sense to that approach. The reason being that if traditionally our farmers would take, uh, let's say, maize, they plant this year, out of the harvest, they select some few seeds ones, seeds then... as the, for the next season, and then replant. Now, over time, you see yield decreases because now uh, I wouldn't want to bore us with the genetics yeah, and all that. Sure, but sure. what you realize is that yield decreases along the line. But if you're using the first generation of seeds, you have high yields. So you, you ultimately have uniformity in your pro, you know, produce. You have you know, constant giving all, all things being equal. And this is what we're trying to you know, uh, push to the fact that the world is growing. We need to feed ourselves. We need to you know, reduce waste, whether post-harvest losses resulting from uh, diseases and pests or we not managing our own product. We need to these technologies to help us. Right. And I think that is how we should look at it and know that there are challenges. Yeah. And the last point I would raise is that GMO is the only technology that has had strong you know, regulations and restrictions with it. So in terms of safety, I think we are even in the best, you know, environment, uh, you know, environment than to, uh, to be scared that. of it. Thank you so much. At least I'm going to walk home feeling better. <laughs> All right. Now, banking, Dave, banking. Uh, I had at the, the recent, is this Salbo, the conference in Singapore, the big banking thing that oh, happened yeah. in Singapore. I had uh, the word blockchain was mentioned 7,600 and something <laughs> times. You had it. Yes. What's up? Are you guys scared or are you embracing it? 
Because I hear uh, it's going to make you disappear. Well, I mean, I, I guess technically uh, when we talk about finance, I'm on the fintech side of things. So uh, things like blockchain and cryptocurrencies excite me. They don't scare me. Uh, traditional bankers and regulators more than even the traditional bankers, I think, are the ones that are a bit hesitant and uh, perturbed about, about this. Um, uh, I mean, the key, uh, especially with, with blockchain and cryptocurrencies, the key uh, concept behind them is that you don't have a central regulatory body uh, dictating, you know, how much of it is out there, or, you know, what happens. And it's a distributed network uh, for peer-to-peer -peer exchange of value, uh, currency, money, whatever you want to call it. And I think that distributed nature of it is what makes people scared. Uh, back to your example of open source software. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, mm -hmm. that idea that software is going to be out there for free. Anybody can take it. They can do whatever they want with it. Scared a lot of big companies, and it took them a long time to get to the point where now they even contribute to open source softwares because they see the kind of innovation that can happen when that type of uh, you know both technology and infrastructure is made available. Um, and I think it's going to be the same with cryptocurrencies and uh, uh, with blockchain technologies. Uh, the key part of blockchain being the immutable records. The fact that every transaction uh, is recorded and it's recorded everywhere. Uh, so once it's recorded in Ghana, it's distributed across you know different machines in different parts of the world. Nobody can change it. Uh, we can always go back and, and reference it. Um, that opens the doors for a lot of innovation. And the fact that um, you know this is both technology and infrastructure that's available to uh, almost anybody mm -hmm. with with the right tools. Uh, that, again, I think opens the doors for uh, a lot of uh, innovation. But again, um, I mean, central uh, regulatory bodies exist for a reason, to protect uh, certain uh, national interests, right? It, it wouldn't make sense if all of a sudden we decided to take all our gold and start flooding the market or take all our oil, uh, it, it, it would disrupt the wealth system. Um, and so I do think that's a, a key role that these institutions can play. Um, and us as fintechs and as uh, entities that are interested in pushing these new technologies have to do a good job of uh, really helping them to understand what it is that we want uh, to do with it. Um, and I, I want to address the earlier point about people losing their jobs uh, because of technology yeah, in general. Sure. Um, so, for example, at Bloom Impact, our, our, our goal is actually to Uberize uh, access to finance for small businesses. Hmm. I think Uber's key innovation, even though you know moving from point A to point B has always been around is to say, instead of you going out and trying to find every single person who will take you to point B, you, you can just sit at home and say, I want to go to point B, right? And then everybody fights, the drivers fight and say, I will take you to point B, and then they take you to point B, right? Uh, right now, if you want to get a loan or open an account as a, as a small business, you have to go to every bank and try and apply, and you, know, you may be successful with some, you may fail with others. Uh, our service of Bloom Impact is sit at home and say what you need and, and let us know what your financial uh, situation is. So you say, I want a 1,000 CD loan or you know, a 15,000 CD loan, um, and this is my financial status. This is my location in terms of finance. Um, and then we do the matching, send it to the banks, the financial institutions, and they come after you. Now, the key there is that right now the banks do it uh, by sending uh, agents around sometimes sure. to go and find people. So the question is, is that agent going to lose his job? Um, and my answer is no. What we're doing in terms of the information we collect from you as you fill out your mobile app and you send the application uh, on is that now when that agent comes to talk to you, that conversation, he's coming from a point of information or having more information, and that conversation can be more... Uh, can be richer and can be more focused and can save more time, right? So we've, we've collected how much money you have. Do you have guarantors? Do you have collateral? All of that. So when I come as an agent, I'm now asking you, can I see that collateral that you said you had? Instead of me sitting down, having that whole yeah. conversation with you. Yeah. So saving your time. And so in, in this case, and I think generally, people will lose their jobs sometimes in tec uh, when technology innovations come into play. But the jobs just shift. And the skills that are needed to fill those new gaps will create new opportunities and new jobs for, uh, for people. Perfect. Now, the, the term you use, Uberizing, right? Yeah. You know, I... It's like Kleenex, you know. So I work for, I work for an edutech company, eCampus, right? And I had the opportunity to spend some time in uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, I was at NASA. And then when I was pitching eCampus for the first time, 
right? We said we want to make teachers billionaires and, you know, we get teachers on our platform and then people will follow them, we share the money with them. The first panelist was like, oh, that's like Uber for teachers. I'm like, nah, <laughs> it's e-campus. What do you mean? Yeah. Now, that brings me to a very important thing. See, you guys have been so successful so quickly. People are even trying to Uberize their lives and stuff. No, we are not going to do that e-campus. Now, I want to ask you, what do you think self drive autonomous vehicles will do to Uber? I know you're thinking about that. So you tell me, but not the, like, the strategic thing. Just give me a fair idea. Will Uber go away when self-drive cars come around? Well, I mean, we're actively investing in self-driving cars. So it's definitely, I mean, if you are involved in disruptive technology and if you truly embrace technology, right, you're always thinking about what's next, right? And so, yes, self-driving cars are the, probably the next thing, right? I mean, there's Uber Elevate, which is our flying cars. All of these technologies we're actively uh, investing in and actively pursuing what the possibilities hold for, for that. So and you're we, saying Uber uh, is moving away from managing drivers and car owners to actually owning the vehicles. So I'm not, I'm not saying that. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that. <laughs> what I'm saying is that we are definitely testing out autonomous vehicles. In fact, okay. in, in two markets in the United States, we actually have autonomous vehicles on the road. Now, yes, there are still drivers behind the wheel, but the drivers aren't actually driving the vehicles. The vehicles are driving themselves. The drivers are just there as a safety protocol. Say what? A safety protocol. Oh, protocol. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. So um, it definitely is something that we're, you're always thinking into the future and what does that look like. Um, and self-driving cars are definitely something that we are actively pursuing. So I've been thinking of this scenario, uh -huh. right? I think I shared that with you in our subgroup, right? Uh -huh. We are very disruptive, don't worry. Uh -huh. And so now with blockchain, my Tesla has an account, right? So my Tesla can trade. So if I need to go somewhere, I call my Tesla, I call the Tesla, which is not owned by me, nobody owns a car. I call the Tesla, the Tesla comes, right? There's a transaction between my account, my blockchain account, and he's the Tesla's account, picks me, drives itself. When his tires are worn out, it goes to a shop to fix itself. Where will Uber be in that? We'll be there. It's just a matter of, of, of re-envisioning where we'll be, right? I mean, because I, I feel like when, when, you're, when you're embracing technology and you're truly thinking like forward thinking, right? Yes, there are self-driving cars, and that's what lots of people are talking about. But what about when there's flying cars, right? What about when we're teleporting? Like, what about drones? I mean, all those things. Like, as a technology company, those are all things that we have to continue to think about and reimagine and really, like, work with, like, engineering and forward just thinking individuals, right, of, like, reimagining what the possibilities are. I mean, even if you look at um, car companies, like traditional car companies, like they realize that the day of like individual car ownership is probably coming to an end, yeah, right? Sure. And what is the next step? What is that next thing? And like, I don't necessarily think we know completely yet, but the, I, the, we're open to the idea of like, what does that look like? And embracing that and not running away from it. Yes, there will be another disruption after this disruption. Thank and you, should you be open to that. for accepting there will be a disruption. <laughs> now for our audience, um, I need tough questions. It looks like this guy's on top of you know, on top of what you're doing. I want to have tough questions. So I see a hand there. I see one here too. Uh, where else? And I see another one. Okay, so let's take the lady. Uh, Eric, I'll come to you. Don't worry. <laughs> Madam. Your Thank name, you. Uh, My name's Diana Drumner. And um, um, I'm the CEO of the Learning Nuggets, plus also... Uh, Mahiri Telmedics. I think I spoke about that yesterday. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, all for, you know, technology and the disruptive nature of t technology, but listening to you, I get scared. <laughs> 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 and the reason why I get scared is Uber, in the last day or so, you've lost millions of records of, um, you know, uh, passengers and drivers, and there's an issue there at the moment. Um, genetically modified um, foods and crops. Um, America is fine, but Europe is not. Mm -hmm. So it, it would have been really good to have somebody from, you know, government or the regulatory Fooling, yeah. body on this panel. Technology is moving ahead. What kind of social, you know, sort of uh, uh, policies are you putting in your companies to ensure that people who are not as... Uh, perhaps a fay or aware of technology can also be, you know, sort of comfortably moved along. 
Because what would be really disastrous is if, um, through the introduction of some of your technologies, are people not only losing jobs, but have other uh, impacts? So that's the question I have. What kind of social you know, consciousness are, are you, policies do you have within your own organizations to ensure that this doesn't happen? Okay, so let's take like two or three and then we put it together. So that's social consciousness. So, uh, Eric, yeah, please. I saw a hand here. Is it okay, there? my name is Eric, Eric Bota. Uh, my question is quite very untechnical, uh, but pardon me for it because I'm not a tech person. But I know that a few years back, you could find somebody on a mobile phone making a call for about an hour or over. And then each morning when you woke up and picked your phone, you could find about 10 or more SMEs, I mean SMS. I have seen that it's been a very long time that I noticed anybody on phone for about an hour just picking on phone. And I've seen that the number of S SMS that I receive are reducing apart from those that come from the banks. Uh, it appears to me that telecommunication is virtually going data because at least the Facebooking is being done, the Instagram staff is there, the Twitter staff is there, the WhatsApps every day we are all there. My simple question is to all of you, 10 years from now, how do you see technology influencing your individual industries? And how are you planning ahead of time to bring along some of us who are not tech people, uh, if it comes to the agriculture sector, if it comes to the banking sector, if it comes to Uber, if it comes to the health sector, in 10 years, for example, to come, how do we see tech influencing these various industries? That is my question. Okay. I think we'll take this two, then we'll pick another two after that. Yeah. I got my eyes on you. So... <laughs> Yeah, so let's look at the, regu the regulatory environment and how we bring the people along, the social consciousness, so we don't create a gap where the technology creates more social inequalities, right? That was what you we were driving at. I think when we began, you mentioned something around those lines. So if we can touch on that quickly, what do you think? Everybody say something very straightforward. Yeah. I, mean, I, I, I think those are very like well noted points, right? Like, I mean, as we expand like technology, we really just have to think about the, the ethics, right, behind like technology and how do we keep people safe as we like just technology like explodes, right, and continue to have like those conversations and like. Um, as this gentleman to, to my left said, also having really good and robust conversations with like regulators so that they actually truly like understand like technology and what its benefits are, but also what like the loopholes are, right? And like, I mean, I think smart regulation is also like key to it. But then I also, I think it's like, I mean, one of Uber, a, as we enter this kind of new phase with our new CEO, one of our core like values is right, do the right thing all the time, right? And like, I think that technology has to keep kind of considering that and really kind of reevaluating um, that technology and its impact on people. And we talk about um, actual like technology like divides, right? I mean, different markets, and as you know, my gentleman to the, to the left said as well, right? The technology in some ways amplifies the, 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 the society, right? And so technology doesn't exist separate from society, but it exists as a part of society. And even if you're talking about something like Fentech or something like using technology for ride sharing, there's also other aspects of like society that you kind of have to bring into those conversations and, and have discussions. I mean, one of the biggest things, you know, I talk about with people and when I'm talking to like regulators, et cetera, is like when you are talking about moving people from point A to point B, there's infrastructure that go into that that expand beyond traditional like the technology world that I'm into so for instance roads right I have lots of conversations with individuals who manage roads who deal with roads etc which isn't necessarily quote unquote core to technology but it's core to, to, to getting an individual from point A to point B on the uh, on, on the banking side uh, there a couple threats uh, uh, if you will um, uh, in terms of leaving people behind um, 
the, the first obviously has to do with as we move to a lot of automated systems that can, you know, in his scenario, automate a lot of financial transactions or simplify it is, you know, what happens to people's data. Um, when, when I go to a bank and I get a loan and that information is digitized or, you know, I use some um, app to do that, uh, you know, what happens to that data? How is that data used? Uh, for me or against me and what kind of consent can be given. And yesterday's panel, uh, you know, we covered a little bit about how we can uh, better uh, improve, um, you know, uh, basically giving consent uh, to uh, how your data is used and also how the data is stored. And I think both on the technology side, there are things that are being done, but also in the, in the realm, we have the Data Pro uh, Protection Commission and such who, uh, who are going to ensure that entities like, like us um, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, protecting uh, both the individual rights and also the data rights of, of people who may not be fully aware of that. Um, the second part uh, for us, and which is actually very important uh, for us, is, is the uh, concept of financial inclusion. As we move forward really fast with technology and as, you know, different financial products become available, we want to make sure that we're including everybody else, that everybody in the, rural, in the most rural parts of the world has access uh, at least to some form of fi uh, a formal financial service. Uh, that is key for the growth of a country's economic and, and, and social development. Um, and so you would find that, especially in the fintech space, and yesterday we had people who were, uh, uh, you know, dealing with issues of identity or making it easier to identify people. Uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, insurance tech. All these different technologies are specifically geared towards making sure that we include more people in the financial uh, revolution that we are trying to create. Um, and so, that, you know, making sure we don't leave people behind is actually, uh, if you will, one of our core values. So, uh, I'll, I'll speak to the healthcare sector, and I think the, the question you, you put across is very important. We need a lot of regulation because things are moving very fast in terms of the healthcare space. I mean, healthcare space is over a trillion uh, dollar industry. I mean, it's, it's huge. and so many things are happening. Even if you are to cast our minds back home, uh, people need, uh, there's a lot of dialysis. I'm sure most of you have been to, some of you have been to the dialysis unit at uh, Kolebu and all. Uh, because we are not living healthy, a lot of people are getting kidney diseases and kidney problems. Now globally, about a million people need new kidneys as a transplant of kidneys. But uh, typically, uh, what is available is about 5,000 that people get yearly. And that gets to the smuggling. I'm sure most of you have read about all the illegal trade of kidneys that is going on. People actually kill people to smuggle their kidneys to sell. So in healthcare, we need a lot of regulation to foster some of these things. Another thing that is coming up, even in the healthcare space, is people are trying to put all your healthcare data on a chip and try to store under your arm. And it's also something that is coming up. So the question is, I mean, how far can we go? I mean, is, is this something that we should encourage? And I mean, all your information is stored in a chip under your arm. And I mean, the Christians who say maybe it's even the beginning of 666 and other things. And I'm sure, it, so the healthcare space really, really need a lot of, a lot of regulation and other. Just to chip in quickly to your question about the 10 years from now, I think 10 years from now, healthcare is going to be more digital and more mobile. I think uh, people are going to live more healthier and we are not going to see a lot of hospitals around. It's even started in other countries where you sit at home and then take a picture of your, I've talked about skin problem that you have. The doctors diagnose it. If you need to do a lab, you, you just take the blood sample yourself ship it and then the results are analyzed and sent to you. So I think a lot of disruptions are going on and 10 years from now health is going to be very digital, very mobile and the, the players that can I mean see that right from now can uh, those who are going to stand up from there sure. Yeah. Okay um, so on the issue of GMOs and uh, the regulations. And so uh, as a company, we don't deal in GMOs. It was just an issue of, for discussion. And I think as a country, we still have a lot of dialogue going on. Um, there is a bill even in parliament on the um, plant breeders bill. And so I think we need more dialogue. Uh, we need to understand the 
critical issues when it comes to GMO, and I think that should be the way forward. But yes, as a country, uh, we need to understand what is in for us, what are the benefits uh, as for our farmers who are struggling with uh, diseases and pests because now there is climate change, weather patterns have you know, um, changed, and so you can't even predict whether you're having less rainfall, there are droughts, if we can genetically engineer our crops to be able to survive in arid regions, need less water. What are the implications for that? We need to, as a country, dis discuss this and agree to go forward. I think that is the approach. And as a company, um, Farmer Line, we're a social enterprise, and our core mission is to empower farmers to make decisions for themselves. By so de doing, they become more successful. And so what we can do by providing them information, access to services, products, that is what we believe we position, that's where we position ourselves. So making it possible for farmers to know um, decisions they are taking is in their own interest. They, are, they can access um, what is good, what is bad, and they make the choice for themselves. That is how we position ourselves. Uh, and so in that respect, uh, I think we will want to push in that forefront of uh, providing that access and connecting farmers to the necessary information they need to make the right choices. And that would be the way for it for us. And then would engage in dialogue with uh, regulators. Um, I think on the side of regulation, when you say we need a lot of regulation, maybe for the health, but I think we need to weigh that uh, regulation sometimes hinder progress. progress. So we need to look at how we balance that. Um, on, the, on your question, 10 years from now, I think in the agri sector, there's going to be a lot of uh, you know, improvement. There's a lot of digitization going on. And so farmers are getting more access to f mobile. Um, we are going to better understand them. But what would really improve, I think, is in the area of distribution of you know, products and services to these farmers, because that has been and continues to be the challenge we have. There's a lot of food produced in you know, uh, rural areas, and yet they don't get to the city center. You've got glut in some parts, there is you know, scarce in other parts. How we combine, how we able to you know, um, evenly distribute this, or figuring, using technology on one side to do that will be the way forward, I think, in the coming you know, uh, 10 years. And I, I believe mobile is part, will play a key role. Um, there are issues on drones and whatnot. So, so many things, you know, will flow in that, uh, what All you right. call it, mix. Looks yeah. like we're out of time, but I, I <laughs> promise two people I'll take their question. Be we here for them. So I'm going to give Akosia the, you know, please, two questions quickly. Uh, one, okay. One, yeah, please. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon or good morning. My name is David. I'm from MTN. Okay. Uh, but I'm not speaking in the name of MTN. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm coming back to the GMO thing. You've mentioned that you know you're not in that space and that there's dialogue. But one critical uh, subject that I want to be looked at carefully is that um, apart from the health and safety bit, we should also look critically about security. Because um, the way it works is you have seed, and it works fine. You have a genetically engineered maize that has protein content improved. Now people can eat just banku, and they will not get kwashioko and all that, the drought resistance and all that. But the problem is you, 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 you grow crops, and next year you'd have to go back to the company for your seed and we know what is going on around the world. Tomorrow, somebody would say, okay, do this or we'll not give you seats. You know, so the problem here is food security. We should not put our um, uh, food security in the hands of okay. some other country. Otherwise, they'll All control right. us. Uh, Thank you case. so much. I think that, that just settles the case for GMOs. And we're so happy. I think things are clear. I'm walking away knowing that we need to be progressive. We need to have a lot of dialogue. Decision makers should be willing to have those dialogues. And then we should think more about security. For me, 10 years from now, I want to talk to Siri 
tell him I don't feel very fine. So then I can what? Print my medicine with my 3D printer in my house and swallow it. See you tomorrow. Thank you.